I'd like to invite our first session uh, speaker and moderator to join me on the stage. Our presenter, Sarah Mendelson, is the senior advisor and co-director of the Human Rights Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. She works within the Washington, D.C. community to broaden and expand constituencies for justice while engaging uh, opportunities uh, and challenges for human rights principles around the world. Just yesterday, she received word, and I think we should give her a round of applause here in a moment, that she has been confirmed as the U.S. representative on the United Nations Economic and Social Committee with the rank of ambassador and as the U.S. representative, dep alternate representative to all sessions at the U.N. General Assembly. So, Sarah, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. And um, our moderator, Rachel K. Paloza, is a partner with DLA Piper, former U.S. attorney. During her tenure as U.S. attorney, Rachel named prosecution of human traffic trafficking a law enforcement priority for the first time in Minnesota and became a national leader on this civil rights issue. So, Rachel, thank you so much and take it away. Good morning. Thank you, Tom, for that kind introduction. Uh, I, I want to also thank the Minnesota International Center for graciously allowing uh, Dr. Mendelssohn and I to come here and speak about this very important issue. Um, and I'm really uh, grateful to all of you who have taken time out of your busy lives uh, to, come, to come and learn more about this very important issue. And I'm particularly encouraged to see so many young people out in the audience today. Um, it's wonderful to have your energy and your enthusiasm behind this project. Um, I, this is my um, first fall back home after being away and on the East Coast for eight years, and I'm really honored that in my first sort of re-engagement with the Twin Cities community, I'm able to speak on a topic about which I'm very passionate, uh, and Dr. Mendelssohn is extremely knowledgeable. Um, you, you should go online and look up her biography. She's an incredibly impressive woman. Uh, among uh, uh, many other things, she has been a global expert on human trafficking. I was particularly uh, pleased to see her educational pedigree. She received her BA from Yale University and her PhD from Columbia, and along the way racked up more Ivy League credentials than I think any person I've ever had the privilege of meeting in my life. Um, but as a fellow Yale, I was, I was uh, particularly uh, pleased to see that degree. Um, Another famous Yale woman, uh, our former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, once famously told the United Nations that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. And um, for an issue that has largely, in the public mind, been associated with a women's rights issue, I wonder if we could just start, Dr. Mendelssohn, by um, you talking to this group about why human trafficking is a human rights issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, good morning. It's great to be with you. Um, thank you so much, Carol, uh, Nellie, uh, the Minnesota International Center for bringing us here. You had a fantastic introduction from Tom that was absolutely comprehensive. Um, and I think a lot of uh, important facts were laid out in a very logical way. Um, and some of those we'll, we'll be going back to because it is a topic that a lot of journalists who should know better confuse trafficking and, and smuggling. Um, to answer your very specific question, you know, I think initially, partly because uh, in, in sort of the last 20 years, when the Soviet Union collapsed, as Tom was saying, there was an initial focus on the trafficking of women and girls. Um, there was a lot of there were a lot of articles about it. Over time, and, and you see this um, in the New York Times and their coverage, obviously with ISIL and the trafficking of Yazidi women and girls. But there's been an expansion, and so now people are talking about, for example, there was a wonderful series about essentially trafficking at sea labor trafficking in the fishing industry. Um, there's something I, I hadn't realized until earlier this year. The North Korean government is in the business of essentially producing labor for cash 
to countries. Uh, so there were a group of researchers in South Korea who did this wonderful study finding that governments were essentially participating in the trafficking of labor from North Korea. Um, these are North Korean citizens who are brought to, say, Qatar to build a stadium uh, or to participate in the building of hotels that would support Qatar hosting the World Cup in, I think it's 2022. Um, that seems like a, uh, a loophole in sanctions that needs to be closed. So the more that people do research, the more that journalists cover the story, we find trafficking in, in all its different forms. But I think initially, um, the, some of the most tangible examples were of, of women and girls, and of course, uh, it continues to this day. But that was only getting about half the picture. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that light. <laughs> well, we're bringing sunlight to uh, the issue of, of trafficking. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mendelson, um, as we're looking out at this audience, I see a lot of students here and, and very young people, and, and I'm feeling older just looking out at <laughs> <laughs> this group. Imagine how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> no. I wonder if, and I know Tom gave a fantastic overview of, of sort of the definitions of human trafficking. I wonder if you could break that down mm -hmm. and talk about just the ABCs of what is human trafficking, how do we define it today? So one way to do that is um, the AMPs, the act, the means, the purpose. So the act is the recruitment, the transport, transfer, harboring, or receipt of people. So first, it's that issue of movement and recruiting. The second is the means, and this is for me probably the most important piece. If you don't learn anything except this, keep in mind this is about force, fraud, coercion. This is about people being bought and sold. Um, so it's the force, fraud, coercion, deception. Um, and this is absolutely the critical piece of how this is different from, from smuggling. And then the purpose is about exploitation. Force, fraud, coercion for the purpose of exploitation, and that can be for forced labor, uh, sexual exploitation, slavery. Um, so I think that that's, that's a useful way to, to think about it. So you, one of the things that we all have a responsibility for is both understanding what this is, being aware of it, and keeping your eyes open for it. And then we're going to talk a little bit in a bit about what you as powerful consumers, people who have dollars in your pocket, how you can, uh, and oh, by the way, you have representatives in Congress and uh, in the House and the Senate. I live in the District of Columbia. We, we are not as privileged. Um, your voters, uh, or some of you will soon be voters, you have all sorts of power in which to demand um, policies, but also as citizens um, and buyers of goods uh, especially on the internet, to demand that the private sector be uh, a, a, a partner in this. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Dr. Mendelson, you, you uh, focused the audience on the theme of force, fraud, and coercion. And people often who are interested or just learning about human trafficking um, ask, what does that really mean? Does human trafficking necessarily involve physical violence? It can involve, uh, it, it usually does. I mean, one of the things that you uh, realize, sometimes people talk about issues like trafficking as uh, a soft issue. Um, when I worked at USAID, we had a, a wonderful deputy, um, a, a man named Don Steinberg, who was a huge champion of not only gender equity, but he was he was very clear about how the kind of violence that you see is anything but soft. Um, this is uh, an issue in which there's enormous amounts of violence. If you've ever seen the movie Taken, there are lots of seats. If, if you're having trouble finding a place to sit, there's, there's places further up, so make yourselves comfortable. But it can also be a psychological issue. Um, that's where deception becomes 
absolutely critical. So for example, you're a trafficked victim, but I'm the, let's say, or you are the trafficker, you are threatening that person that you're gonna hurt their family that are back home. And it's through that psychological manipulation uh, that is most uh, oftentimes terrifying. Um, maybe you're not actually being physically beaten up, but you're terrified that something's gonna happen to your mom or your dad. How widespread is the problem of human trafficking? Could you give us just a sense of the numbers that we're talking about? So this is a, oftentimes a hidden crime. Uh, it's difficult to research. Um, by and large, it's been difficult to find funding to research. So the numbers vary enormously. Uh, the US government usually uses the number about 20 million, relying on the um, International Labor Organization's number. But there are other organizations that say the number is as high as 36 million. Um, the truth is uh, we don't know exact precise numbers. Um, we know that there are large swaths of populations in certain places that are, are being trafficked um, and that we need to have more and better precise numbers um, in order to be able to, to combat trafficking. Do you have a sense of whether the numbers are increasing or decreasing uh, over time? You know, in some way, the politics of numbers is, in some ways it's a bit of a distraction because honestly, if there are 10 people that are being trafficked, we should be outraged. In the 21st century, there's no reason why this should be going on. We have enormous amounts of legal infrastructure, international agreements um, that make this a crime, uh, for which, of course, you have lots of experience uh, in, in prosecuting. So I think that oftentimes, as a way, in some ways, of being defensive, people say, oh, well, the problem is not that serious. Now, in a bit, we're gonna get to some good news coming out of the United Nations um, that gives us a bit of a lift in terms of all hands on deck, let's make sure nobody is trafficked. Um, so when, when people come back to you and say, well, it's not as bad as people say, uh, as long as there are any souls that are being uh, trafficked, you should be outraged. Agreed. Um, Dr. Mendelson, I, I want to shift to your personal engagement in this issue, which has been su substantial both as a scholar uh, and as a public policy leader. Could you tell us first, um, based on your scholarship, what you've learned uh, from your research on combating human trafficking? Um, everybody, as you come to this topic, you have different ways of engaging. It's a painful topic. And you need to figure out what is the place that you can do work and not become overwhelmed by the topic. Um, for some people, they have tremendous grace and they're able to work with survivors. Um, the closer you get to survivors, the harder it is. There's a lot of work to be done on the prosecution side. There's a lot of work to be done on the policy side, on the research side. And I found, I mean, I, I trained political scientist. Um, I found that that was a particularly good place for me to be able to do the work and be productive. Um, and then of course in, in the policy world, uh, helping to be a leader uh, and, and champion it. Um, I learned that there is both uh, tremendous leadership, that leadership really matters, that um, when you step forward in an organization and you wanna work on this issue, there are a lot of people that come behind you um, and wanna be part of the solution. Um, but there's also complicity. I mean, you heard Tom talk about the border guards or the police. Um, for every brave police person that you're gonna find, there might be somebody who's been complicit and, and involved in this. Um, I think that the, another important lesson was learning to find ways of listening to survivors and having the survivors be part of whatever solutions um, 
there's much more that needs to be done in that. But one of the, the pieces of, of work that I enjoyed the most was actually survey work. Um, large random sample surveys, in this case it was of Russian um, women, um, and really finding out what did they know, what was their experience, what did they know about this issue, what was their experience about this issue. But to be able to, des to design either really good programs or policies or even uh, an app, a, a technical um, response to this, you need to have um, survivors in, in the mix. Now, as we know from your biography, you, you did not remain uh, I strictly in academia, and we have the benefit of your leadership as a public pan uh, policy leader as well. Can you tell us what you learned about human trafficking at USAID? So what's amazing about working in government is that you have global issues that you're dealing with. But there are ways of being entrepreneurial and harnessing uh, policy. And when I got to AID, trafficking was sitting in a different bureau from the one that I was in. Um, and I made an argument to the leadership that it should be in our bureau and, uh, and that I would push it forward. Um, and then the first thing we did was to make sure that we had our own house in order, that we had a code of conduct and to begin to train everybody. The US Agency for International Development is it's our way of engaging around the world uh, to help make a more peaceful, prosperous world, right? So as taxpayers, um, or as the children of taxpayers, it's only about 1% of um, the budget. It's a tiny amount of money that's going to do enormous good, but if you think about it, uh, the buying and selling of people is the opposite of, of development, right? It's the opposite of being in a peaceful, prosperous world. So we wanted to have a code of conduct to make sure the 8,000 plus employees that work around the world for AID know about it and are not involved in it. We wanted to make sure that there was a kind of coherence to what AID was doing, so we wrote a policy. Um, and made some priorities. Um, and then we wrote a field guide so that people would understand in the field how to use the, the policy, how to, how to program. Um, we got very excited about technology uh, and partnership, and we launched something called Challenge Slavery. Um, it was a bit of an experiment, uh, didn't cost much money. It was basically a call to action to students uh, it was a competition where we asked students to crowdsource ideas of what would be uh, good solutions to combating trafficking. And we learned a lot. Uh, we learned that crowdsourcing doesn't always generate good ideas. Sometimes it generates ideas that actually could hurt um, survivors. Um, but we had some excellent ideas. Uh, the winners involved, and I'll just tell you briefly, um, how many of you bought anything from Amazon ever? Okay. <laughs> I thought Amazon was only in the business of selling books, but apparently not. So one idea was that you as a consumer would go to Amazon and you wanted to buy something, you wanted to know whether or not the good that you were buying was slave free. Um, there was a next bit which we had to figure out how to get to Amazon to agree to this, but that was the brilliant idea that these students came up with. Um, there was another fabulous idea involving the largest social media platform uh, in Africa called Mixit, and ha having a way of engage linking up um, survivors with police. Um, and then a really ambitious idea and this gets to something that Tom was talking about, was the, the, the need to have, if you think about the trafficking of people involves networks, right? These are criminal networks. To combat trafficking, we have to be a network. We have to be better networked than they are. And part of the problem is we've got, you know, you've got, you have a handful of people who regard themselves as champions of combating trafficking. 
Everybody needs to be that. Your neighbors, your cousins, we all need to be a part of this. So we need a uh, networks of business, and of course Carlson has been um, in the front lines of, of getting the private sector to be engaged. We need every diplomat to be a part of this. We need students to understand, I mean, your generation, your generation can change this, and we're gonna talk about why over the next 15 years there's an enormous opportunity that, that essentially the world has come together to, to bless. Um, you could be the generation that says, you know, enough is enough. We're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna take it anymore. Um, so that that the the networking idea that this um, one student came up with, it's very elaborate and complicated and it involves large data sets. But I think that that's ultimately where we're going. I think uh, there is a an effort actually deep inside um, the Pentagon that is looking at using technology to be able to combat uh, trafficking. So um, a kind of 21st century way of, of doing it. Mm -hmm. Your research and your public policy uh, work have really spanned the globe. It, and you're about to be our official voice to the body that, that uh, speaks for the world. Is there a global strategy to combat human trafficking? And if so, uh, what is it? <coughs> So yes, and also, um, coming out of the, the, uh, the definition that was agreed to this Palermo protocol that Tom talked about, and again, remember it's the act, recruitment, transport, transfer, the means, force, fraud, coercion, deception, the purpose, exploitation. Coming out of that agreement, there is essentially a kind of strategy or paradigm, and it, again, it's the, the three Ps, plus the fourth one, the prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnership. And prevention is about everybody knowing about this, you know, understanding that it's out there, awareness, but also making sure that people have access to education, that they're good jobs, um, that there's a justice system. Um, protection is making sure that if somebody is actually trafficked, that there's, um, there are safe places for them to be. Prosecution, we're gonna talk about. We'd love to hear a little bit about your experience. Um, and then the partnership. Um, US government can't do this alone. No government can. Private sector has a role. Citizens, every citizen has, has a potential role. Um, so that's been the, the general paradigm. I think that we need to, th there's still gaps, there's a lot of gaps in terms of financing, there's gaps in terms of networks. Um, some people think there's been an over-reliance on prosecution, but prosecution is enormously important. I wanna ask you, what? tell us something about your experience as a prosecutor. I mean, when you think about, everybody watches crime shows, right? Um, the fastest, easiest way to justice, and you get justice you know, inside a a 60 minute TV show is really like 40 minutes, 45 minutes. You know, those are like the superheroes, right? They walk into the court and they do their thing and, and justice is done. So, superhero? Uh, not quite. Um, th this is interesting. I've never had somebody turn the tables on me <laughs> and ask me a question, but this is an interesting lesson in leadership for all you students out there, and I think it's an example of why Dr. Mendelssohn's gonna be a great ambassador. She listens, and she's interested in engaging other people. So as I say, I've probably been doing things like this for 20 years, and this is the first time somebody asked me uh, a question in a forum like this, but I'm delighted to, to answer the question because we do have a good record in Minnesota, and, and you all should know about that. Um, and I think, I think I can answer that question sort of in three parts. First, just the statutory framework. What are the law enforcement tools for dealing with this problem on the federal side? Um, so as, as uh, um, Professor Hansen was mentioning earlier, prior to the year 2000, the standard federal tools to deal with human trafficking, which frankly was not a major law enforcement priority, were statutes like the Mann Act, uh, which was uh, essentially institutionalized to prevent what they called white slavery, trafficking in, in uh, uh, mostly Anglo women, as well as the uh, the RICO Act, uh, 
racketeer influenced corrupt organizations, which, you know, again, had been instituted for a different purpose, primarily to focus on the mafia and other criminal enterprises, but uh, human trafficking typically involves a criminal enterprise. And um, we also uh, could use the conspiracy statutes uh, on the federal books, but those were hard to sort of piece together, to put together a prosecution. And so uh, something significant happened in the year 2000. There was a sea change in how we looked uh, at this problem and how we decided to address it collaboratively collaboratively from the federal side, Congress, in a bipartisan effort, passed the Trafficking Victim Protection Act in the year 2000. Um, that gave law enforcement the tools to define what human trafficking was, to define what victims were, and to give us federal jurisdiction over what was now a federal crime. Um, so when I came to Minnesota uh, as U.S. Attorney in the year 2006, um, we had this tool, uh, but what we, and we also had a pretty serious situation where our state, Interestingly, it was considered one of the top five human trafficking jurisdictions in the country. Um, but as of that moment, we had brought zero cases uh, under the human trafficking statute. So, so we had these tools, but we didn't have uh, any prosecution efforts on that side. But fortunately, um, we did have a great team of law enforcement, of prosecutors, and NGOs, uh, community organizations that were very interested in the issue, and I'm very proud of the collaborative effort that people in Minnesota um, uh, brought to the table, federal, state, and local law enforcement, NGOs um, dealing with victims, line prosecutors who had never prosecuted these types of crimes, willing to learn how to put a case together and take the risk of actually losing in court but willing to stand up for justice, uh, which is what people did. And in less than two years, we brought over 32 cases in Minnesota obviously vaulted us to the top of the national list, and that would not have been possible without a team effort. Um, and why is this important to us just sort of every day? Again, going back to our theme, this is an issue of fundamental justice. Um, this is an issue of human rights, and to address something that Professor Hansen um, brought up earlier, the lie at the heart of human trafficking is that human life is cheap. Human life is not cheap. <laughs> And our country is founded on the principle that human life is precious uh, and that we will, we will fight to protect the value of human life. So uh, I'm very glad and very privileged to have been part of that fight. And I'm, I'm grateful that folks like Dr. Mendelson and, and Mick continue to be engaged in it on a very important level. 2000 was an incredibly important year. Thank you. Um, we are... The last two weeks, the United Nations met high-level week. President Obama went to New York. Um, all the world leaders went to New York. And they, they adopted something called the Sustainable Development Goals, or hashtag global goals. Um, I think it was two weeks ago, Saturday, there was a huge concert in Central Park. Um, you can find it. Uh, on the internet and watch it. It's a the world introduction to what these global goals are. It's very exciting. In 2000, at the UN, while on the one hand, they were adopting the protocol on combating trafficking, right, a definition to understand what human trafficking was, they were also adopting the Millennial Development Goals. Trafficking was not a part of the MDGs. When the international community adopted the MDGs, something amazing happened. Countries from around the world came together and they began to organize the way in which they were doing development and funding for development. Um, so huge amounts of funding going into the eradication of, uh, or reduction of HIV, um, trying to extend the life of uh, children beyond five years old, and it was, it was extremely powerful, but there was a, rights, a human rights frame that was left out of the MDGs. I was doing other things um, in the human rights community. We were a bit left out, so the MDGs did not figure very large for me. When I got to USAID in 2010, and I could see the impact that this kind of coordinated effort had had, I thought, hmm, there's going to be a renewal of these goals in 2015. We have to have justice, human rights, a part of this. And wouldn't it be great if we had something about human trafficking 
in the goals. So uh, over the last three years, around the world, there has been a conversation. Youth, young people have been hugely involved. There has never been a document that has been more talked about, agreed to, voted on, top to bottom, leaders to parliaments to publics. And that three-year conversation has resulted in the sustainable uh, development goals, hashtag global goals. Um, and guess what? There is lots of opportunity. There is language in here. Um, I'm going to just read two things very quickly. Take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor and modern slavery and human trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers, and by 2025, and child labor in all its forms. Now, the good news is last week, two weeks ago, they adopted these. These go into force January 1, 2016. They're 15 years to implement them. Right now, the task is to figure out what does meaningful implementation look like. And presumably, as I take up this new post, that will be a big piece of talking to all sorts of people about what will we be looking for? How do we implement this? What does this mean? Who's going to pay for it? How do we, how do we, how do we go forward on this? But the good news is we have, we have a policy hook. We have uh, a blessing to focus on this. Those of us who were trying to raise this issue and people would say, why are you focused on this? Why, why are you making this such an issue? We've, we've gotten past that. It's, it's in this document and we can use that. Uh, and these goals, the global goals, the S, uh, SDGs, SDGs sustainable, sustainable, development sustainable Development Goals. The point about this is this applies to everybody. If in 20, 2000 it was the Millennial Development Goals applying to the developing world, SDGs are universal. Now that makes it even more complicated because there's going to have to be a national action plan for the U.S. How do, how do we do better? Uh, on all these goals. And oh, by the way, there are 17 goals and 169 indicators. I just read you one. Um, there are other places where trafficking is there, and there are other there are, there are goals in which where you know justice is at the at the heart of it mm -hmm. that um, we'll be able to use their, their their goals around education that are gonna have obviously knock-on effects on combating trafficking. The, the most important goal, perhaps, the number one goal is about eradicating poverty. Um, this is obviously a huge aspect. I mean, the idea of having decent jobs and decent work uh, and decent economies. Um, so we're in, a, in an interesting place where there's a governance focus, justice, there's a focus on uh, education, there's a wonderful, there's a goal on gender uh, equity. Um, so if we can tie it all together, we've got really uh, an, am an amazing opportunity over the next uh, 15 years, which was, for those of you who are 15, you're going to be 30 someday, believe it or not. Um, this is your generation. You guys are the ones who are going to make the difference. And when you do that hashtag global goals and you go to see that concert that was uh, broadcast uh, two weeks ago, there's a whole I'm a global citizen uh, campaign going on, um, and uh, you know, it's in, in a lot of ways, it really is up to uh, the next generation. How are these goals related to CTIP, combating trafficking in persons? And maybe you could um, just uh, describe briefly what CTIP is. So CTIP is a uh, acronym for, you know, this is this is the lesson I've learned in, in government. There are acronyms for everything. CTIP is combating trafficking in persons. We talk about trafficking, we talk about human trafficking, we talk about TIP, C-TIP. Um, sometimes we just talk about trafficking. Um, again, I mean, it's a little bit to what I was just talking about. There are um, various ways in which the goals are going to uh, play out. Um, 17 goals end poverty in all its forms everywhere. What we need to do, this is the homework for the next 
I think actually people are trying to get this done by March and it may bleed into June, July, but people want to have a good sense in the next couple months of what, how are we going to implement these? And I think different people are going to be looking at it for the different issues that they work on. Um, for my own, in my own mind, I'm thinking, when I look through all these goals, where is the intersection with human trafficking? There are places where it is absolutely explicit. Um, I just read you, uh, 8.7 is the indicator. I think there's a huge opportunity around um, sort of generating demand and good programming and policies um, and norms about eradicating particularly trafficking in minors. I think you're finding a lot of agreement around that. Um, although, it, you know, it's, it's not easy. There's also eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls in the public and private spheres, including trafficking. Um, there's going to be language about climate change that may have some aspect. Um, there's uh, goals around, again, education. That's going to have some. There's uh, ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Believe it or not, there going to be aspects from that goal that are going to be relevant. So we need to really dig deep, understand what these goals are, and begin to think through how do they crosswalk with combating trafficking. So I know folks in this audience also have goals, and I also know you have family from just north of this part of the country. This is a very engaged uh, citizenship. We have an engaged uh, academic community, an engaged um, um, service community, engaged corporate partners, and as you can see from this audience, very engaged young people. Um, a number of these questions, and we're going to try to get to these before we have to wrap it up, but a number of these questions focus on what can we do as citizens to be involved in this? What can be done on the ground level? So first, people should know that there is a, a phone number in the United States that if you think that you, I mean, like Tom uh, in that hotel um, in Thailand, seeing an American citizen involved in that, which is clearly a crime for which he could, should have been prosecuted. Um, in your travels, in your going about your life, if you think you are seeing something, um, here's the phone number. Uh, I'm going to say it, and then you're gonna, we're going to talk about the structure of it. 888 37 37 888. So it's three eights, three seven, three seven, eight eight eight. Um, as consumers, you should be demanding that your products are slave free. Um, how many of you eat chocolate? Everybody, right? Um, there's a lot of trafficking of children in and around the harvesting of, of cocoa. And companies are very sensitive to this. They want to have clean supply chains. Um, as consumers, you can demand that your chocolate is slave free. Um, how many of you wear cotton? Everybody wears cotton, right? Well, cotton comes from places including Central Asia, Uzbekistan, where there's a, a lot of labor trafficking. Um, so at a very basic level, in your consumption, um, you know, we want to make sure that our iPhones are um, not made with slave labor. Um, then there's policy and prosecution. And it's funny to hear somebody laugh when we're talking about trafficking, but um, you've got wonderful representation in the Senate. Uh, they've been leaders on this. The Senate is actually extremely focused on this. Senators Corker and Cardin, who chair the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, are passionate about this issue. Um, making clear to your members of Congress that this is important uh, and supporting um, legislation uh, is something that's important. Um, can you talk about the specifics of that, Dr. Mendelson? I mean, what specifically can someone who's addicted to chocolate mm -hmm. uh, do to hold companies accountable for not using child labor to harvest cocoa, for example? Well, you as a lawyer can do all sorts of things, but there, there's, there's all sorts of citizen, uh, there are actually some lawsuits out there um, that are 
uh, and I have no idea whether they're on good standing. I don't. I. I all I know is that the the, the law for the um, the cases are out there. Um, fishing industry as well, shrimp as well. Um, demand from your grocery store that the food that you're eating is coming from um, not from slaves. You don't want to be a part of a uh, a slave industry. Um, so to put it at a, at a very practical level, start a petition, start online campaigns, sure. write to the companies, put things on the web. Sure. Um, letters to the editor, engaging with journalists, doing your own research. Um, a lot of this is about raising awareness mm -hmm. and, and asking for uh, accountable. You know, a lot of heads of companies don't want to be involved in the slave trade. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I'd be cur I don't know how the Carlson company came to this issue, but obviously in, if you think about, uh, certainly in the case of sex trafficking, a lot of this was taking place inside the tourist industry, and and people were being, um, because there's a transport aspect to this, uh, the tourism industry, whether it's planes, trains, uh, or in hotels, you need to have um, leadership in the tourism industry that is cleaning this up. And for that, we are very grateful to uh, the example of, of uh, the Carlson uh, family and that group of companies. Um, and, and that begins to have a tipping point. Other companies want to get on board, uh, Hilton, um, Hyatt. Uh, if you're in a group of companies and you've got these guys over here doing all this good work and you're not, you know, that's a bit of, you don't want to be over there. You want to be with these guys. Um, and... So leadership comes from a lot of different places. It can come from you demanding something of the things that you are consuming. It can come from, on occasion, people who own these companies and, and wanting to do, do the right thing and having an industry be, be clean. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and so one of the repeated questions here is, I'm interested in this issue, I'm a student, uh, what would you recommend for me in terms of getting involved or my path of study? Um, it's a great question. Um, by the way, you know, the internet is both, it, this, it helps fuel trafficking, but it can also help combat trafficking. And if you Google, what can I do there are, to combat trafficking, there's all sorts of stuff that comes up. Um, there's lots of different paths. Uh, you can go work, you can go volunteer uh, in an NGO that works on this issue. You could go work with, um, NGOs that work with survivors. Uh, you can study hard and go to law school and become a lawyer and prosecute or work with human rights defenders. Um, you can, God forbid, go to graduate school and get a PhD in political science and begin to research it. You can become a sociologist and do survey work. You can join the Foreign Service and become a diplomat and have this be part of your um, mandate uh, and be that person in the embassy who brings this issue up and demands uh, from their leadership that this is an important issue. Uh, you can grow up to become an ambassador one day. Um, do you have any, um, as you look out into the future and, and your goals and hopes and aspirations of what you'd like to achieve in this space, what do you see in the future? Well, I want to be able to figure out how to harness this document to get m more. When I was at AID, I would go around the world and I would talk to other representatives of other governments who were great partners in development. But for whatever reason, they weren't working on either human rights or combating trafficking. And I th thought, well, that's odd. Why would they, you know, what, because they didn't have a mandate. There was nothing pushing them. This document is going to help for every government that I talked to that said, we don't do this. There is a reason for them to change. And so if we can collaborate, coordinate, have additional funds to work on this together, um, including with, uh, in this case, members of the Senate, 
I think that that's going to be, we could just raise the whole, we just need to have more people doing this, more funds going to this. We need to learn from other kinds of campaigns and apply it to um, this issue and really, in some ways, both raise the level of outrage over this issue, but very strategic, practical uh, work that goes on, in it, including additional funds to, to work on this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mendelson. Um, and I want to thank the members of the audience who've been so engaged and help us, helped us to have a very uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you for coming to Minnesota to share your expertise on this. Be grateful you were not invited in January. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your public service and leadership. Congratulations on your confirmation. Again, we're delighted to be able to share this day with you, and we look forward to officially addressing you as ambassador. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.